The love of the sea has always been with me. One of my favorite places to go when I was younger was a beautiful beach in Thailand. If you were to ask me to describe what heaven looks like, that's what it looks like to me. And I took my children there to share that experience and uh, we rented a boat. There was massive excitement. We swam ashore and unfortunately, it was knee deep in plastic. Imagine decaying dead birds, am I stepping on syringes, no idea. And my daughter, who was four at the time, yeah, I had to grab her, and she just looked up at me and she said, why? And I couldn't answer. I could not give her a reason for why that beach was in that state. And that was a real turning point for me. Running a big platform like Archerik and being aware of our processes, the materials we use, I became increasingly concerned about how little was expected of you as a leader. I felt very uncomfortable about how everything was normalized. If you looked at the business's numbers, everything was great. But inside, I had a little storm brewing. You know, I, I felt time was just passing. I was escaping the uncomfortable feeling by busying myself all the time and surrounding myself with people and things to do. I was numbing myself a little bit maybe, like we all do. I had a good friend, David, who, who pulled me aside one day and said, look, I have never seen you alone, not even for a second. So I thought, obviously there's something here. I need to face myself and stop patting myself on the back with other people's judgment of how good things are going and really decide what I need to do. What is it that'll make me happy and make me feel fulfilled? What could I do to make a difference? I had this fire burning inside me because I knew what was happening in terms of the climate, in terms of ecosystem destruction, but I was really struggling talking to people about sustainability. I had the audience, I had access to business leaders who would give me their time but nothing would ever get through because sustainability is something abstract. You're talking about, unfortunately, labels like 2030, 2050. Everybody thinks it's someone else's problem. It makes it very difficult to get people to focus. I had thought about going to Everest and it suddenly sparked this thing in my head saying, well, wait a minute, what if I combined Everest with sustainability to so kind of raise awareness? Because Everest, everybody wants to hear. I could change my colleagues' attitude towards sustainability. We always had it as a vision statement in the company, but never really had it in the center of everything we do. If you'd asked me before I went, I would have said, this is just purely to get the sustainability message out, the awareness, it's just a tool. Of course I can climb Everest, you know, I can, I can do anything. I read everything I could, talked to all the subject matter experts, hired the best organizer, trained more than I've ever trained. I did everything right. So I thought, if I've done all of that, I'm going to be better than all the others. I'm just going to get up there and get down, and it's done. Of course, you figure out very quickly when you get there it's not true. meters and that's the first sighting of Everest. Base camp looks like Mars to me, you know, it's just rocks and thin air, extremely cold at night, extremely hot during the day, so you're never comfortable and your body doesn't want to be there. The fact is that nothing lives there. You know, you leave some seeds or crumbs of bread on the ground, come back a week later, it's still there. And it kind of makes you think, what the hell am I doing here? We've now left base camp. We're in great spirits, having a lot of fun. My only worry is I'm gonna have to spoon with two Frenchmen up there, which isn't exactly my ideal situation for a holiday. But the views are incredible. I'm meditating, taking step after step. I'm in a good place, and I wanted to share it with you.
After one day, all of us were bloodied completely in our airways. All of our feet were full of wounds. I mean, you could tell, you know, these super prepared, high ego, successful businessmen were not suited to the mountain. And uh, every day, the mountain told us a little bit more of that. The death zone is above 7,000 meters, basically, where North Col uh, is. And uh, you have to climb this ice wall that looks like the winter wall in Game of Thrones. And at the top uh, is this very thin strip of ice where you set up the, the tents. Very intimidating place. And uh, from there, uh, the amount of oxygen available to you is far less. Your body starts slowly deteriorating and consuming itself and there's only a limited amount of time you can stay there. Four days, five days max, but not longer. That's an altitude where if you sleep without oxygen, there's a very high likelihood you won't wake up. You just have to fight through the night with this drowning feeling the whole time. Lucas, one of the most celebrated and experienced organizers of high altitude mountaineering at 7,000 meters, pulled me aside and said, look, from here on, you're on your own. If you can't walk, if something happens to you, you're staying on the mountain. Nobody's going to carry you down. You are on your own, you look after yourself. And that really sinks in, because until that moment, I thought I've hired the best organizers, I've really prepared myself. If I've done all of that, of course I'm not in danger. That scared me. It really scared me. And then seeing the dead bodies, one of the curses of high altitude is that you're completely preserved. You can see the faces, the expressions, and the contorted arms. When I started seeing all of this, I said, that's it, I'm going back. And uh, the, the Austrian guide who was behind me said, you know, Hakan, I'm sorry, but uh, it's much more dangerous to go back from here now because of the crowd behind us. The chances you slip or an accident happens are extremely high. The sheer level of exhaustion that's continuous kept forcing me to question myself and my decisions and why I was there. Every step I took, I became more aware of how futile this approach was and how unimportant my life was. At that altitude, you're seeing the curvature of Earth, you're seeing the deep blue of space, and you understand that your survival is completely dependent on nature. How crazy of humanity to think that we could battle nature and win. Who you are, what you've done, none of that matters. And the more I realized that, I think the more I changed as a person. The summit was uh, euphoric for a moment. You know, it's the size of two ping pong tables. A few moments later, the Sherpas left and I was alone. I was looking down at the world. How on earth I was gonna get down was beyond me. For me, the journey up was full of learnings. I was doing a lot of work on myself. All of that distracted me from the real danger for a while. On the way down, none of that was there. The feeling was overwhelming, that I wanted to get back to my family, I wanted to get back to my children. If only I could get down alive. And when I got to advanced base camp, my feet were in pieces, you know, I was in horrific pain. Uh, but at least what I felt is relief. And what should have taken sort of five, six hours to walk down to base camp took me 12 hours. And those 12 hours, I think, were the most transformative in my life. I, tr I cried the whole way. One thing the Himalayas has is scale. Everything is huge and you are so small. 
And everything that you have worried about in your life up to that moment feels just pure stupidity. And you keep scolding yourself on how could you be so naive to think that those were the important things in life? How could I have missed these things? How could I have not told my father that I love him more? Or how could I have not really focused on my children when they came up to me and said, Dad, let's play. Now I have an email to send. Now I'm drinking my coffee. Later, never again. Because that kid is not going to ask you twice or three times. And then, of course, you get caught up in this, well, what was I thinking? What if something happened? What would happen to them? I mean, but I couldn't even call them. I, I just, I couldn't. I was crying the whole time. That ego I had going up of this prepared person, I can do anything, was, thank God I'm alive. And I'm so grateful for nature to have allowed me to survive. Uh, when I got back, I was very, very different. I became obsessed with time. I had no time to waste. I have much less patience for PowerPoint presentations talking about how good we're doing things. I just want to hear about the problems and solve them. It sped the transformation of the company we manage into a purposeful business. And then, of course, everything changes because then everyone's aligned around the same goal uh, and it brings success with it very, very quickly. Today, we have a business that is disrupting our industry because we're focusing so much on the environment and the climate and reducing emissions. What we were doing as humanity, making promises, but we were delaying implementing those promises. And the impact of delaying those promises every day made it more irreversible, the damage we're doing. Once you start seeing that, the sense of urgency, it overtakes everything else because you know that if you don't do the right thing today, it's going to be too late to do it tomorrow. And therefore, you're faced with a moral choice. Will you be able to look your children in their eyes and say, oh, well, I didn't really realize and I was going with the bandwagon? Or do you want to say, I saw this coming and I did everything in my power to stop it from happening? I chose the latter one.